Father, thank you so much for the opportunity that we have to worship you in your house. And Lord, as we prepare to study your word, we ask that you would speak to our hearts. Holy Spirit, would you speak through me as I preach your word? And Lord, I pray that as we, as we look to your word, I pray that we would see you for who you are. I ask that we would love you more as a result of what we find, that we would be convicted and challenged uh, to grow in our faith and how we and how we live. And Lord, I pray that you would give each person exactly what they need. Thank you for this time that we have to worship together. And I pray that you'd be with those who are uh, traveling and are in different places for the holidays. I ask that you'd be with our church family as we're, as we're about. Uh, the Lord, now as we focus on your word, help us to just focus in uh, on what you have for us today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, let's go ahead and take our Bibles together and turn to Matthew chapter number 13. Matthew chapter 13. If you have a Bible there, go ahead and open it. And while they do that, uh, I'm going to ask Colt and Aldo, they have a gift uh, for you to start the message. So they are going to deliver a little gift for you. And if you would, uh, they have a gift that they're going to deliver to you. So take that, hold it for a second. But whatever you do, don't eat it yet. Don't eat it yet. So when you get it, we have a little snack for you a little a little aftertaste of feastology but there's a little gift for you uh matthew chapter 13 and then while they are getting those out i wanted to show you guys just because i'm so excited as a brand new dad i wanted to show you guys some pictures of my expanded family so if we could go ahead this was last night we are now officially a family of six uh, which feels kind of weird because growing up, we would always, when we go out to eat, we'd always hear like over the speakers at Cracker Barrel or whatever, uh, Crips party of six. And that was my, that was my family of origin growing up. Well, now we're a Crips party of six. Uh, so we had Gabrielle Deborah Crips. She was born on my grandmother's birthday on Friday afternoon at two o'clock, eight pounds, two ounces, and I think 20 inches, 20 inches long. Uh, and she is, she's got me wrapped around her finger already. It took no time. Part of it is because every time I pick her up to hold her, not everybody can say this, but every time I pick her up to hold her, she doesn't cry. She, do, she stops crying. She just like, she just snuggles in and she is sweet as can be. And I'm looking forward to y'all meeting her. And then there's one more picture. This is like right after she was born and I can't get enough of the chubby cheeks. Uh, and she is just, I, I, I'm in love. I'm in love. Like, I don't know another way to say it, but there's our baby girl. And I'm so excited for you to meet her. Um, I think that they will be here, not next, this upcoming Sunday, but the Sunday after. Adriana will be back, Lord willing, uh, with the baby. So Matthew chapter number 13, and we are going to begin reading together in verse, uh, verse number 24. Uh, Matthew chapter 13 and verse 24. It says, Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares, or read their weeds, also. So the servants came of the household, so the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not up sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? He said unto them, An enemy has done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go, uh, go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while we gather up the tares, you root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather you together first to the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them. But gather the wheat unto my barn. And if you could go ahead and skip down to verse number 36, it says, Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house, and the disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. He answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world. And the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of 
17. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun, and the kingdom of their father, who hath ears to hear, let him hear. We have been walking through a sermon series, the teachings of Jesus, looking at his parables in Matthew 13, and now we get to the parable of the wheat and the tares. So there in your seat, you have a gift from me to you. If you would go ahead and take it, just hold it up to me. You have some raspberries. In just a moment, we are going to eat these raspberries together. Don't eat them yet. Uh, so, but there they are. They are just your, they're your standard raspberries. Uh, but there is one thing before we eat them that I want to tell you. There are a couple of raspberries uh, that are poison. Uh, not, not like poison poison, not like you're going to die, not like you're going to be uh, just, all right, I don't know, in other words, uh, it, has some, it has some laxative with it. So you might be leaving the service a little bit early. But don't worry, it's just, it's just one or two. It's just one or two. So in all likelihood, there's like a 90%, those probably like 90, those probably 90 raspberries. Those one or two, most of them are still, some of them are still in the back. Uh, so you have like 1% chance of leaving the service early this morning, okay? Uh, so you guys ready to eat it? Ready? One, two, three. Some of you are actually eating. So either one, you do not believe me. You don't believe me. Or two, you're just, I don't know, really hungry. I don't know. Uh, but most of you, most of you, some of you ate it. They were good. They, they didn't actually have, they didn't actually have laxative in it. Y'all are okay. Some of you just really want to get out of the service, I guess. Uh, so, but, uh, you know, whenever I told you that there was a small chance that there was, uh, that your raspberries were messed with, uh, it changed, it impacted the way that you thought about eating those berries. So, you see, when you are aware that your decisions make a significant impact you think about them differently. You had some raspberries and just eating raspberries, no big deal. Uh, but whenever you know that it may have an impact on you, a different kind of impact on you, then you think about those decisions differently. Here in Matthew chapter 13, Jesus is giving parables and he's giving parables to the people of Israel. Israel has all gathered before Jesus and Jesus right now, he's actually, he's actually on the water teaching them. And he's sitting on the water so that way he gets, basically it makes a, it makes a microphone in the, ancient, in the ancient world. Jesus is sitting on a boat, he's teaching from the water and everyone is listening and he's giving a series of parables. And the different parables that Jesus is giving, there is a reason why he is speaking in parables. The disciples, a couple of weeks ago, we saw earlier in Matthew 13, they asked, Jesus, why are you teaching in parables? Why are you telling these stories that are difficult to understand? And Jesus makes it clear that his parables are, are for those who, uh, who, those who follow him, those who love him, those who want to know more about him. Whenever people would listen to the parables, it would cause them to wrestle uh, with what he was teaching. And as a result, they would grow to uh, love him. They would grow deeper in their faith for those that wanted to follow Jesus, for those who didn't want to follow Jesus, for those who were just sitting in the crowd because they were looking to twist his words, they were looking to attack him. Jesus was telling parables so that it would conceal the truth of what he was saying from them so that he could make it to the cross. That's why Jesus was speaking in these parables. But as Jesus tells this parable, the parable of the wheat and the tares or the wheat and the weeds Jesus is telling a parable to get those who follow him, those who are interested in him, those who are sitting, listening to his story, to think differently about, one, who they are. As Jesus is telling this parable, he wants you to think differently about who you are, and he's wanting you to think differently about the way that you live your life. In light of who he is, whenever I consider who God is, it should change the way that I view myself, and it should change the way that I live. So in this parable, this one is a little bit, this one is a difficult parable, but I want to give you three statements as we walk, as we walk through this parable together. Uh, I want to give you three statements to help you understand, to wrestle with, and by God's grace and by his spirit be changed uh, through this. So the first statement that we need to look at as we get into this parable is this, <laughs> is that one, the story of history is the story of God. The story of history is the story of God. 
Let's look in verse number 20, uh, verse number 24. It says, Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field, but while men slept, his enemies came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. Uh, so as Jesus is telling this parable, he's telling a story that everyone would be very familiar with this kind of idea. He tells a story about this farmer. Now, farmers, they are uh, they're just kind of the stereotypical Jewish person. Everyone, like agriculture was the prime way that people made money and made a living and made a life. So he's telling the story about a farmer, and a farmer goes to his field, and he starts to sow good seed into his field. Now, we don't know, and, and we don't know just in general how people got uh, seed. They might have had, he might have had to go uh, work and trade. He might have had to make some promises whenever he went to the market to buy good seed for his field. Maybe he had saved some from his last harvest. Maybe he had saved some good seed from his last harvest for this year's crops. And, but whatever the case is, this farmer is taking good care of his land and he is sowing good seed into his field. And he's doing all of this so that he can really simply so he can take care of his family. He is raising wheat. He is sowing wheat so that he can just make a living just like uh, you do and just like I do. And while this man goes out, he sows good seed into his field. And this process was actually a three-month process. So it was a two to three-month process to sow seed in the field. They would, have to, uh, they would have to till up the ground of their fields. And most of that was all done by hand. They would, uh, they would till up the ground. They would till up the soil. They would make sure that the soil was ready to, to take the seed and that it would produce good crops in this case and this parable that Jesus tells to raise up wheat. Uh, so they do all of this, they do all of this prep work of the ground. They've got the seed, they've sowed the seed in the land. And, and I'm just imagining in the story, this is a little bit of my own imagination, uh, that as this farmer goes to sow the seed, like he's making sure that these are in like good orderly rows so that way he can get the maximum benefit. Like he cares about this field and we see it whenever it says that he's out there just sowing good seed. He has his employees or he has his servants and they are helping him sow the seed. So he's working away. And then in verse 25, it says, but while the men slept. Now, everything that I found from this is this is not an indicator that these servants uh, were lazy. This isn't an indicator that uh, that they this wasn't an indicator that they were slacking on the job. And it's indicated by the fact that they don't get rebuked. They don't get rebuked. The idea of this is just after you put in a full day's work, after you put in months of labor where, where your entire livelihood is all based on the work that you've just done, now it's time for them to rest. And there's no reason why they should have to stay up through the night anyway. All they're doing is sowing seed in a field, right? Like they're not, they're not protecting the Pentagon. They're not protecting the White House. They're not, uh, this isn't a castle that they're, that they're on guard. Like this is a, this is a field. This is farmland. Uh, but it says that while they slept, his enemy came and sowed tares or weed among the wheat. Now, as I was just getting into this story, I was thinking, man, how, how, how petty, I don't know another way to say it, but how petty can you be than for this, this enemy? So this was a pretty common thing. In fact, there was Roman law. Uh, there was Roman law against sowing tares or sowing weeds in another person's field. Now, I don't know why you'd want to do it in your own field. That wasn't illegal, but it was illegal to sow wheat, to sow weed in somebody else's field. It was that common of a practice. Now, it might have been because of competition. If they were just, if they were competing in the market to sell more than each other, they might sow weeds in the field to ruin the other person's crops. But for, for, for whatever reason, uh, Jesus doesn't say. He's just telling the story, something that they would all be very familiar with this kind of thing happening. Uh, the enemy comes in the middle of the night, which is just the, the, uh, the epitome of pettiness, the fact that this enemy would stay up all night harm themselves, harm their good sleep, which I know something about because I didn't get very much sleep last night with my new baby at home, uh, but staying up all night just so they can ruin this good farmer's field. Can you, can you just identify with that for a second? Can you identify with that for a second? Just someone out there to make, to make this farmer's life miserable. Just doing whatever it takes, staying up in the middle of the night to just ruin Try to, to try to ruin his life. But he comes and he sows tares among the, the wheat and went his way. In the verse 26, it says, But when the blade was sprung up, when the blade was sprung up and brought forth, 
brought forth fruit, then it appeared also tares. In verse 27, it says, So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, did not thou sow good seed in thy field? So the, the servants, the employees, they come to the field owner and they say, Hey, didn't you get good seed? Did you, uh, did you buy, did you get swindled? Did you get bad seed at the market? What, like, what is going on with this? Because there is a bunch of wheat, but there's also a bunch of weeds here. And they say, Did you not sow good seed in your field? Where did, these, where did all these weeds come from? And he said unto them, an enemy hath done this. An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, what wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? Uh, so so they, they, come to, they come to the field owner in the morning. They come to him and they say, uh, sir, sir, uh, your, your, field is just, your field is ruined. Your field is messed up. Your field is, uh, your field is full of weeds. What is going on? Did you not do your job right? Did something, is something going wrong with this? Why are all these weeds popped up? And, and I just love the answer. Uh, I love the answer in the story of, of, the, of the farmer. He's just like, an enemy's done this. He doesn't freak out. He doesn't. He just, yeah, an enemy did this. Well, what are we going to do? Are we going to, like, do, like, we should go through the field one by one and pluck out all of these different weeds. Let's, let's, let's go in and let's tear all this up. And then the farmer, knowing what he's doing, he says, no, 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 you, you let them grow together because you don't know what you're doing. You don't know what you're doing. And, and, and here's the reason why. Like, I can't fault them. If we could go ahead and show the picture of the wheat and the weeds. This is what it looked like. So uh, the weeds or the tares here, this was something called darnel or fake wheat. And this is what was most likely sown in the field. So if you look on the screen on the left-hand side, that is wheat before it is ripened. Uh, so before it before it produces wheat, that's what it looks like. On the right are the tares. Can you tell much of a difference? If you were working in a field and you were looking at these side by, side by side, do you think that you could pick the right one? What is actually wheat and what is actually weeds? No, probably not. So that's what it looked like. That's what the wheat and the tares looked like. So he says, hey, you guys, you guys don't know what you're doing. You guys can't, you guys can't tell it apart. And besides, all of, the, all of the root system of the wheat and the weeds, they're all intertwined now. So to pull out the weeds, to pull out the weeds, you're just going to hurt the actual good wheat. So you're either going to pull good wheat or in pulling the bad wheat, you're going to pull up good wheat and hurt good wheat with it. So he says, just wait. Just be patient. Just hang on a second. Uh, because once it all grows and once the wheat actually becomes mature, once it actually starts producing fruit, then you can clearly tell what's what. So he says, just let it, let it be. He says, the reapers are going to come. And just in this setting, the reapers and the servants in the text are, are different. Uh, the reapers are like the specialists. The reapers are the one, they, they were on a different pay grade in, in the Jewish society. The reapers were the ones who would come in and they would they would pull up, they would they would get they would gather the harvest and they would separate everything out. And, and it was a different, those are two different jobs, those are different sets of people. So he tells the servants, he says, Hey guys, the reapers are gonna come, they're gonna take care of it, uh, and I'm gonna sort it all out. So don't worry about it, just let it grow together. You you did your job. You did your job, good job. So then they go, and then it grows up, and then it closes. Jesus closes his parable by saying uh, that whenever the harvest comes, he separates it out. The farmer separates it out. He gets all of the good wheat together, and he takes the weeds, and he sets them off to the side. And the weeds are then rightfully so. They're all burned up. And then the wheat is gathered into the barn. Now, as we get into this parable, it's very easy as we look at it. And a lot of people, when, when they start to look at this, you start seeing, okay, here are some principles for us to understand and live by, right? But let's just take a reading of this. Let's, th let's think through this again. If, uh, if you have a, if you are a farmer and you have a field, and how many of you have ever had someone in your life who would just seem like they were out to get you and they were out to, they were out to mess with you and they were out to like, uh, they were out to mess with your life. And then what do I do? How do I handle things whenever I'm trying to do good, but everyone else is trying to mess with somebody else, whether it's a boss, whether it's a family member, whether it's a, whether it's a friend, like somebody else is trying to mess with what the good thing that I'm trying to do and, and then and trying to read into this hey, like how, how do I work all of this how do I work all of this out but there's something very clear that we have to get 
we have to get right off the bat as we get into this parable so we can, one, understand the parable, and two, so we can understand our place in it, and that is this, is that this story, this parable is not a parable about you, and it's not a parable about me primarily. This isn't a parable saying, okay, here are some principles for you. Here's some principles that you need to live by. Here's some things that you need to do. Uh, I saw, I was, I was looking for an illustration for later in the message, and I saw it right off the bat online. Somebody, somebody posted, are there tares in your field? Are there, is there wheat in your field? Uh, you got to protect your field. Don't let, don't let the enemy sow tares in your field. But here is the reality is that the farmer is Jesus. This is about his kingdom. This is about what he's doing in the world. He is the hero of the story. And one, when you read this parable, but two, when you read the scriptures, you need to understand that the story of history, the storm of the story of time, the story of the life that we are in, the story of our world is ultimately first and foremost, it is the story of God. It's the story of God. He is the hero of the story. You are not the hero of the story. This is a story about what he's doing in the world. This is it's not a story about uh, about about you being you being this farmer and not letting the enemy get tares into your field. Like that's not what it's about. God is the hero of the story. God is the hero of the Bible, and God should be the centerpiece of your life. God should be the center of your story. Can I ask you this question? Uh, who is the farmer in your story? Is God the farmer of the story in your life? Or are you the farmer of the story in your life? And if I could say it this way, if I could just ask a couple of questions to help you wrestle with this yourself. Like, is God, is God the, like the cornerstone of your, is God the cornerstone of your family? Is God, is God the cornerstone of your life? Or is he just the decorations? Whose approval matters most in your life? Teenager, does, does the approval of your, of your friends, does what they think about you, is what they think about what you do, is that's what most important, is that what drives your decision making, or is what God says and what God thinks and what his word says, is that what is most important to you? Is God just, is God just something that you think about on Sunday, but is he completely separated from the rest of your week? If I could say, if I could ask uh, this question is he is he the cornerstone or is he the decor is he the decorations? Whose opinion matters? Young adult, what is your what is your priority? Is it Jesus or is it your career aspirations? Would you say that my goal is that I may know him and the power of his resurrection? On the list of your priorities in your life, where does happiness rank? And where does holiness rank? Is it more important to you that you grow in holiness or is it more important to you that you grow in happiness? If Jesus is the main character of your story, that will impact how we answer these questions, how we live, how we work, how we interact with others. The story of, of history is the story of God. It's the story of God. But next, what we need to notice in the text is that you have a place in God's story. You have a place in God's story. Let's look at verse number 36 together. It says, Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house, and his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. Declare unto us the, par the parable of the tares of the field. And so in verse 37, he answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the son of man. He's, he's the farmer. He's the farmer of the story. This is about him. This is about his work. This is about what he's doing. And then he says, the field is the world, the good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil, the harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. So, so Jesus, he tells this parable, he goes and he tells the story, whenever Jesus comes, uh, he sends everyone away, he sends the crowds away, and the disciples come to Jesus, and the disciples say to Jesus, Jesus, hey, the, and I love it that Jesus tells multiple parables, but the disciples, they say, hey, we want to know about that one. That one sounds, that one sounds the most intense. That one sounds the most scary, like weeds getting uh, burned up, like what's, what's up with that? And here's how Jesus begins to interpret this parable, which is good for us to understand. This is good for us to understand, one, how to interpret all the parables, but two, a good way to just look at Scripture. So here's what Jesus does. First, 
Jesus identifies the characters. Jesus identifies the characters within the context of what he's doing. So in all of the context of Matthew 13, and really the whole gospel of Matthew that we've been looking uh, through together, uh, Jesus is coming into the world. He's offering his kingdom to Israel, and he's talking about what the kingdom of heaven uh, looks like, what his rule and reign is looks like. So he's telling this story over and over again. That's what all of these parables, that's what all of these parables are about. So we need to understand the context of the moment that Jesus is speaking in. But then second, we need to actually have a good understanding of who the characters are in all the parables that we read, but specifically in this one. This is how Jesus goes about interpreting the parables for his disciples. He says, here's what you need to understand. Let's look at who the characters are. So he says, first, uh, the characters are in verse number in verse number thirty seven. He said, "He that sowed the good seed, the farmer is the son of man." That's Jesus. Jesus is the farmer. In verse thirty eight, he says, "The field is the world. The field is just is, is the world that we live in. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. Those are those." who belong to him, those who uh, live under the rule and reign of the Lord Jesus. And it says, but the weeds are the children of the wicked one. The weeds are the children of the wicked one. So let's, let's, let's stop there for just a second. Let's stop there for just a second, because we, we, um, we have to notice something. We have to highlight something. We have to put a, 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 like a flag on something that is a misconception for a lot of people. Jesus puts a difference, like Jesus shows a difference between who the good seed is and who the bad seed is. And how does he identify them? He identifies them as either the children of the kingdom or the children of the evil one. The children of the kingdom or the children of the evil one. And this is something that we need to understand, church, is that a lot of times people have the attitude, a lot of times people think, and, and, and sometimes it's with good intentions, or they've just not been taught, uh, they've just not been taught the way that scripture describes it, but not everyone is a child of God. Not everyone, not everyone is God's child. God is everyone's creator. God is everyone's maker. God is the judge of all. But here in this text, Jesus says that the good seed are the children of the kingdom. They're the they're, they are his children. The bad seed, the weeds, they're, the, they're ch children of hell. They're the children of the evil one. They're a child of Satan. That's the way, that is exactly the way that Jesus says it. And that's not, that's not an easy thing to take. That's not an easy thing to get hold of. But when Jesus is describing who the people of the world are, he says, you are one of two things. You are either a child of God or you are a child of hell. That's big. And it's big for Jesus' audience because Jesus is speaking to an Israelite audience who think that just because they are Jewish, that they are eternally secure. That they will enjoy Abraham's, uh, the way that it says it in scripture is Abraham's bosom. They're going to enjoy paradise forever because they are Israelites, because they are Jewish. And what Jesus is saying to this Jewish audience is that, no, 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 you need to wrestle with this. Uh, you are either, you are either wheat or you are weed. You are wheat or weeds. And we need to understand that because, first of all, if you are a child of God, if you know Jesus as your Savior, and here's the way it's described. Here's who those who know Christ as their Savior. Here's those who are children of the kingdom. Those are the ones, it says later in the text, that they are the righteous ones. They are the righteous ones. Those who are those are the ones who are the children of the kingdom. Those who are righteous. And that's something that's really interesting right off the bat that we have to get down. Is who are the righteous ones? Because the Bible says that none are righteous. There is none righteous, no, not one. A lot of times people think and people have this idea in their, in their lives that, hey, you know what? I will go to heaven someday. I will enjoy eternity with God if my good outweighs my bad. Like if I'm just a good person, if I'm just a good person, then, then I'll be okay whenever it comes to eternity. And that's sound, that, you know, that's hard to argue with because there's a lot of nice people in the world, right? Like you work, you probably work. I think you might work with nice people. You might work with people who say, you know what, I'm a pretty good person. I'm not as bad as, I'm not as, bad as somebody else. I'm, I'm a pretty good person, and it's hard to argue with that. 
But Jesus' standard of those who are the children of the kingdom is not, are they good people? Are they nice people? He says, are you righteous? Are you righteous? So there's a question for you. Are you are you righteous? Not are you nice? Not do you do good things? Are you righteous? And the Bible says that there is none righteous, no, not one. And that's the whole reason why Jesus had to come. That's the whole reason why Jesus had to be born and the whole reason why Jesus had to die. And that's the whole reason why Jesus rose again because the Bible says that Jesus died the just for the unjust, the righteous for the unrighteous. Jesus, the righteous one, and came and died in the place of those who are unrighteous so that he could give to us his righteousness. And the Bible says that whenever you put your faith and your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, when you realize that you are not righteous, when you realize that you are a sinner before a holy God, when you realize that you are a rebel against him, when you realize the way that the scripture says that you are a child of hell because of your sinfulness and God came to give you his righteousness, when you when you realize that you're a sinner, when you turn to the Lord Jesus Christ and you put your faith and your trust in the good news of the gospel that Jesus came, he lived and he died and he he rose again when you put your faith and trust in that then Jesus says here you go here is my righteousness I'm bringing you into my kingdom John 1 12 says as many as received him to them gave you power to become sons of God even to them that believe on his name so there is good news if you are a Christian today is that Jesus has made you righteous and righteous he has given you given to you his righteousness he has made you good seed he has made you wheat that is very good news that he took us and he made he took us from being a child of hell and he's made us a child of God. That is beautiful and that is wonderful news. And whenever you feel at your worst and when you feel at your lowest, whenever you're feeling, whenever you're struggling with life, whenever you're struggling with your own emotions, hey, remember this truth. This is what Paul said in Ephesians 1. He says, my prayer for you is that you would understand, is that you would know, that you would know deeply that you have the love of God, that you have the power of the resurrection, that you are a part of the family that you have been adopted and on your worst day remember Ephesians 2 that you were dead in your trespasses and sins uh, you were slaves to the lust of your flesh and, and the lust of your mind but God because of his rich mercy because of the great love with which he loved us even while we were sinners Christ died for us and it's by grace that you are saved through faith it's not of yourselves it's not your righteousness because your righteousness are as filthy rags before God but by grace are you saved through faith and then not of your yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And there, that is a, there is beauty in that. There is wonder in that. There is celebration in that. That whenever you are at your lowest, God said, I don't accept you based on what you have done. I accept you based on what Jesus has done. That is the good news of the gospel is that if you are wheat, it's only not because of your righteousness. It's because of his righteousness that has been given to you. But then there's the other one. If you are not wheat, if you don't have Jesus' righteousness, then the Bible says that you are a child of the evil one, that you are a child of Satan, that you are a child of hell. And those aren't my words. That's not my outline. That's Jesus's. If you do not know Christ as your Savior, you are a child of the wicked one. And my friend, we live in a world where everyone, Every person that you work with, every family member that you have, every person you interact with, they are one of these two things. They are either a child of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you don't become a child of the Lord Jesus Christ any other way than through the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And every person you work with, every person you interact with, they are either wheat, they are either a child of Jesus, or they are a child of the wicked one. So Jesus said these are the characters. There's the wheat. There's the weed. And then he continues on by saying, they're the children. Uh, they are the children of the wicked one. In verse number 39, he says, the enemy that sowed them is the devil. And then he said, the harvest is the end of the world. And the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares and gap the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of the world. The Son of Man shall send his angels, they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity. 
and shall cast them into a furnace of fire, and there shall be wailing, a weeping, and gnashing of teeth. So Jesus tells the story. Here's how the end of the parable goes. That at the end of time, the wheat, the children of God, are gathered together to be in the presence of the farmer, to be in the presence of Jesus forever. And the weed, the weed, are cast out and they are burned with fire. The Bible says that the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and sorcerers and whoremongers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone. This is the second death. Whoever's name was not found written in the book of life had their part in the lake of fire. Here is the reality that we don't like talking about, but it is true nonetheless, is that everyone will spend eternity somewhere. And those who do not know Christ will spend an eternity separated from God in a place that the Bible calls hell. They will spend an eternity separated from the God who created them, who loved them, who sent his son to die for them. Every person will spend eternity in one of these places. And if you're here today and you don't know that you would spend eternity with the Lord Jesus Christ, then can I tell you that there's an invitation to you that you can become a child of God. And for those of us who do know him, we interact with people who will spend eternity somewhere, who will spend eternity somewhere, either with Jesus forever or forever tormented apart from him. That's the reality of what Jesus describes here in this text. You have a part in God's story. Who, what character are you? You're not the farmer in this story. You're either the weed or you're the wheat. So we see, one, the story of history is the story of God. Two, you have a part in the story. And finally, as we come together for a close, one final principle is this, is that God's story provides focus for your story. God's story provides focus for your story. So in in the parable, whenever they see that there is weed and there is wheat, the, 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 the employees, they come, the servants come to the farmer and they say, what do you want us to do? Knowing that these, this weed and this wheat is growing together, what do we do? Do we start getting rid of all the weed? Do we start attacking all of the weed? Like, what do we do? And then the, the, the farmer, he says, no, here, here's the game plan. They need to grow together because I'm, I'm taking care. I'm taking care of my wheat. I'm taking care of my wheat. Taking care of my wheat. And the beauty of the gospel, and here's where the story breaks down a little bit, is that Jesus is in the, Jesus is in the business of converting weed into wheat. Jesus is in the process of converting tares into wheat. That's the work that Jesus is doing. But he says, hey, just, just hold on a minute. And for those of us who are believers, because we do actually can play in the parable a second role, and that's the role of these servants. Not the reapers, those are the angels in the parable, but the role of the servants who are cultivating, who are cultivating the field, who are cultivating, uh, who are cultivating the wheat. Uh, but he says, hey, just hang on for a second and just uh, just let it be. Cultivate. Basically, he's doing this: spend more time growing grass than pulling weeds. Spend more time, spend more time just cultivating, spend more time taking care of, spend more time sowing good seeds, spend more time uh, growing what we're here to grow than just trying to nitpick everything that is wrong in the world today. Like your job and my job, our mission, uh, our mission isn't to like bring, like is to not to bring social justice to the world. Like our job, like our job is like, Politics is not the end goal of the Christian life. It's not, it's not politics. That's not the end goal of the Christian life. The end goal of the Christian life is not to become political activists. The main goal of believers is to help grow weed. Like if we are going to be the employees, if we're going to be the servants in the parable, and that's the only one that's not identified by Jesus as those who are actually doing work in the field uh, with the farmer. And that should be you and that should be me. Now, he says, hey, listen, your job is to take care, of the, uh, take care of, the, of the wheat. Your job is to help cultivate that. Your job is to help grow that. Here's what he's saying. You are focused on one thing. You're focused on one thing. It's not yanking up the tares. It's sowing more seed. Your job is cultivating that wheat. That is the mission for the servants. 
He's saying, focus on that. Focus on that. And when we live with that focus, then Jesus takes care. Jesus takes care of the rest. It's not to say that we, it's not to say that we don't uh, play a part in the grand scheme of life, but our focus, our focus is the eternal souls of people. That's our focus, is the eternal souls of people. You know, there's just something about a good story. There's something about a good story, and it's it's this pacing. It's something if you like if you ever write stories, there's something about pacing in a story that is like really meaningful, that's really helpful. So I'll I'll say it this way. Uh, Adrian and I, we have like different shows that we've watched. Like we're just like anybody else. Like we we have TV series that we that we like that we've watched. And there's a couple of series that we've watched over the years uh, of our marriage where there's just some TV series that have been like, they've gotten miserable to watch. Uh, have you ever watched one of those series where you got started in a, in a TV series where you were like excited about it, you liked it, and then all of a sudden you get like halfway into it and it's like, this is, this is lame, this is boring, like this isn't going anywhere. And, and here's what we found. And then there's some series that we just like, we really enjoy, that we really like. And here's what we found. And you know you can try me some you can try me sometime. But here's what we have found for me and Adriana for our personality. Here's what we found is that whenever a series is really really long, so for example, let's say that there's like 23, 24, 25 episodes. We found that we tend to not like those series as much, and here's the reason why: is because the storyline, the plot line for the whole series. It's just all over the place. Like, they'll be, like, working up this story, and you'll get really into the story. Like, the superhero's going to win the day. It's getting all awesome. And then they'll just, like, take, like, a three- or four-episode break from the main storyline. And then you spend a month, if you're watching live, not, like, if you're if you're watching live, you're, like, spending the next month saying, I want to find out what happens with that storyline. I don't care about all of this other stuff that you're doing. I want to know what happens uh, with whatever. If there's not focus then it's all over the place, and it's not a great story. But then there's other series, there's other things that we've watched, where it's like, where it's really short, where it's like a series that's like, you know, six episodes. And they just keep that story moving. And it's like, keeps you on the edge of your seat the whole time. And here's the difference between the two. One has focus, and the other one doesn't. And here is the reality of God's story. God's story is laser focused on people having a relationship with himself. It's a, that, that is God's story. God's story is he is bringing all things about for his glory and he's reaching lost sinners and he's bringing them into his family for an eternal relationship with, them, with him so that he, they can enjoy him forever. Like that's the work that God is doing in the world. And you have a part in it. Your part is to be a cultivator of wheat. Your job is to build up the saints. Your job is to share the gospel with the lost. Like that is our focus. And the story all turns out really, really beautiful when we actually focus on the plot. But all, a lot of times our problems is that we'll like, we'll come, we'll like, we'll focus on the plot for a second. And then this is me. This is me for a second. But like, we'll focus on the mission. We'll focus on what God has called us to do. We'll focus on his purposes for our lives. And then we'll just take a little seat. We'll take a little season where we just get distracted with something else. Like we'll get off on, um, get off on subplots. And I just, I imagine, I imagine like, this is just Pardon me for a second, my, my imagination, hopefully it's just holy imagination, is that God is sitting there and he's saying, get back, get back to the main plot. Get back to the main focus. Get back to the main thing. And that's growing, that's growing wheat. That's cultivating wheat. That's sharing the gospel. That's building up each other in our faith. And when we do that, it all turns into a beautiful story. And it is vitally important that we focus on that because every person We'll spend eternity somewhere. So let's be busy about the business that Jesus has given us to do and take part in the beautiful story that he is writing. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we love you. Thank you uh, for your grace. Thank you. Lord, none of us deserve a relationship with you. None of us do. But we're thankful, Jesus, that you came to the rescue for us. Thank you that you loved us so much that you died for us so that we could be made wheat. And Lord, I pray that in this world that we wouldn't get so distracted with either trying to do on one side of, on one ditch, on one side of the road, trying to do maybe good things, but not gospel things. 
help us to avoid that ditch. And then also on the other side, I pray that you'd help us to avoid the ditch of just uh, living for ourselves, of just living to be entertained, of just living for fun, of just living for those other things. And, and none of those things are wrong in and of themselves, enjoying life or trying to just do good in the world. But your primary purpose, the mission that you gave us was to be people of the gospel. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us to be a church that is focused upon that. May we repent where we've strayed off course. May we be busy about your business. In Jesus' name. If you would please keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed for just a moment. I have, I have two questions. I have two questions to ask uh, for every person this morning. The first question is this one, are you weed or are you wheat? Are you a child of God or are you not? If you say, Pastor David, I know for sure that I'm a child of God. I know that I'm a part of God's family. I put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Would you just raise your hand? Would you slip up your hand for a second? If you say, I know Jesus is my Savior. I know that I'm a child of God. Would you raise your hand? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If you say, Pastor, I'm not sure. I don't know for sure that I'm a child of God. I don't know that I'm a part of this family. I, I'm, I'm worried. I'm not sure. I think, I think that I might be weed. I might not be a part of God's family. Would you pray for me? Would you just raise your hand? You say, I'm not, I'm not sure. I think I might, I might be weed. I might not be a part of God's family. Would you pray for me? Would you just raise your hand? Maybe you're here today in this church family. This question is for you. Are you living on mission? Are you living focused? Are you living a life that is focused on what God has given you to do? Are you focused on his purposes or are you living distracted right now? You say, Pastor, will you pray that I would live, I would live on mission, that I would live like focused on what Jesus has given me to do, what he's called me to do. Would you raise your hand? Thank you. I see those hands. I see those hands. I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray for you for a second. Let's take a moment there in our seats to, to respond to God. I know he's spoken in our hearts. Take, a time, take some time to talk to him in prayer about what he's worked on your heart about. And then we'll, we'll close the service. Lord Jesus, thank you for uh, the mission, the story that you've called us into. And Lord, I pray that you, would, that you would help us to live lives focused on, on the calling of God to be people of the gospel. Help us to live lives that are focused on your mission. Take some time there to pray in your seat. Lord Jesus, thank you for how you speak to our hearts. Thank you for how you challenge and work in our lives. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to live differently as a result of seeing uh, the work that you're doing in the world. Help us to live as a part of your story. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let's all stand together. We're going to sing one final song uh, this morning. If you need to continue praying, please continue to do so. Uh, but we're going to pray, crown, we're going to sing, crown him with many crowns. And may that be the prayer and the posture of your heart. Uh, that he would be, that he would be Lord, and that he would rule and reign in your life. So let's sing, crown him with many crowns, one final time, and then we'll be dismissed. <laughs>